Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2 Super Mini Mail Call. And today I'm going to be opening up some small packages. I still have a rather large pile of packages, but I have all these little ones here in a little box. So we'll start with these today. So it's going to be a micro episode because, well, no big packages. So we'll just pick this first one off the pile. This comes from Jason in Barbersville, Virginia. Hi to all my Virginia viewers. I started a mail call episode without any way to cut these open. And you know, the little packages are gonna need a cutting, a cutting mat. So let me grab one of those. It's down over here by the Commodore 64. And we'll grab a knife here and we'll cut this open. Looks like we got a letter and we got a little package and that's it for what's in there. Adrian, greetings from Central Virginia. I hope this letter finds you and your family well. On a previous mail call, you received an LS120 drive that had an odd connector on it. I believe the enclosed adapter is what you need to connect it to your PC. Yeah, I think I have that drive up there. I should look at it. Thanks for being an inspiration to the Retro Bear community. Fellow Retro Computer Repair, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Let's see here. I'm gonna have to go find that drive. But if I recall, it was from like a, maybe a laptop. So it had a little tiny kind of IDE connector or something. All right, there's a couple little screws and yeah, uh, zoom in of course. So regular IDE connection there. And then there it is, the little funny connector that I think was on the drive and a power connector to pass the power through. Plus uh, we have a few little screws and things. Oh, let me go try to find that drive. And you know what, I should fix the camera. So I'm centered. <laughs> Let me go try to find that drive. Ah, I think the drive is right here. This is it. Um, I probably I should zoom out a little bit. So is this an LS120? Class one laser product. Yeah, I think it is because uh, there's the door and um, there is the connector. Oh, it's not even focusing. You know what? This cutting mat makes the camera focus on the, the lines here and it doesn't focus on the things I'm holding. So I think I'm just gonna have to move this out of the way unless I'm cutting open the package that I'm, anyways, anyways, okay. So yeah, there's the drive. This is definitely um, an LS120. This is a super drive. So this works with both three and a half inch floppy drives and higher capacity 120 megabyte versions. And I think it's called a floptical because the 128 meg version uses a laser, a laser as part of the, uh, <laughs> the reading or writing process or something. I'm not super familiar with how that all works, but there is the uh, adapter that was on this. And I think this was sent in by a previous viewer, but if we pop this little adapter off, now this would have been what was on the, the laptop or whatever this was used on. And I think this would clip on here. Let's see if I get this right. Uh, it looks the same. Yes, there it is. It is connected. Now I actually have some other LS120 stuff after I got this drive and it was sent in by viewer Carrie. And it's one of the things that, well, I got ages ago and I haven't shown on a mail call episode yet. And that's, I think it was like from 2021 maybe, or 2022, I think it might be 2021 or the early 2022. These are all things I'm so behind on. So I'm really far behind on everything, but I've gone ahead and I found the box because it was stored in those banker's boxes back there that Carrie sent in. So let's zoom out and take a look at this stuff. So I, I labeled it as LS120 and it's in the like to do mail call pile. Uh, let's see what's in here. So we have a whole pack of uh, brand new super discs. So let's just look at those in a second. And then there is the drive. So we'll just move that off to the side for a sec. First, let's look at the drive. So I think unlike this one here, this is a normal three and a half inch LS120 super drive. And look at that, it just looks like a normal floppy drive. But taking a look at the bottom of these, they're not too dissimilar with like the laser warnings on here and you know, whatever, whatever. Now, unlike a normal floppy drive, a regular floptical drive does have an IDE connection. There's some jumpers there. There's a power connector, which is the standard floppy connector. And let's see what the model number is. I gotta get my goggles to see what this is. Uh, manufacturer 2001. This is an LKM-F934-1 is made by Matsushita or Matsushita. So Panasonic. 
And the other one here is, okay, yeah, so this is also made by Panasonic as well. I don't know if I took these off. This is an LKM FB33-5. So yeah, different there. Um, but otherwise, these are definitely the same manufacturer. I don't know if any other companies made these outside of Panasonic. If I zoomed up, you could see those stickers there. So this is the three and a half inch one on the, the left. This is that, I don't know, laptop size one. I don't even know like what size this is because it's still, it takes the same size discs as these. Um, now I haven't tested either of these. Obviously I just got the adapter for this laptop drive, but why don't we open up one of these discs here and take a look a little closer up because I don't even know if I've ever used one of these. Now, because these are IDE drives, they don't, quite work exactly the same way as a normal floppy drive. You have to hook it up to your computer, obviously with IDE, and then your BIOS has to support booting. If you're gonna like boot a DOS floppy disk, for instance, then you need to have a BIOS that supports that. So only later ones supported that. Obviously this drive here was from 2001, and this one is from 1999. So you can assume that around then, or maybe the late 90s, is when support for booting these, like the LS120 support in the BIOS first appeared. Otherwise, I think you'd need a normal floppy drive on your computer, and once you got into Windows, you could load a driver or whatever and then access floppy drives in this, plus you could access um, these LS120 disks. So there it is, the LS120, iMation <laughs> born of 3M innovation. Okay, yeah, the Super 120 disk, lifetime warranty, I was, Really, really guys, as if I could get a replacement for one of these at this point. The case is very much like a, I don't know, like a zip disc case or, or a CD case or you know something like that. And uh, let's just get the disc out of here. So it does look different than a regular floppy disc, which I have right here. Here's one, I mean, <laughs> if you're not familiar with what a regular three and a half inch disc looks like, there it is. As I said, you can put these into those drives. These regular uh, floppy drive disks do work. But this thing, obviously, you know, while it's similar looking, look, it has the same notches there. Um, the door is quite different. And let's look at the bottom here. What exactly is different? How does the drive tell these apart? Spindle looks exactly the same. These alignment holes, these are just alignment notches and holes. These are all the same. So I guess it figures it out when you stick it in and let's slide this open. Well, it certainly looks like a normal floppy drive. So why is it, why does it have a laser? What exactly does the laser do? Super disc. Now actually, um, I guess, let me put, let me put one of these in here. I'll put this one in first. Okay, so that's in. Oh, unfortunately the eject mechanism is, uh, it's electronic. I thought it was a mechanism. I thought it was a manual thing. So let me grab a power supply. Now that we have this adapter on here, let's try powering this up and see if I can get that disc out of there. Alrighty, so here's a little power supply. I don't have a switch on this one, so I'll unplug that first. And let's connect this up here. I don't want to stress the little connector, so be careful with this. There we go. Okay. And uh, let's plug this power supply in. Well, there's a light on here, but there's nobody home. Oh, well, that's annoying. Luckily that floppy disk I stuck in there was bad. Oh, okay. Um, these leads were getting really hot. So I, Guess this is not the right connector. Did I have this on upside down? Is that even possible? Does that go on backwards? No, it only goes on one way. Huh. Yeah, I like that. Let me just double check that. Well, no, everything, everything appears to be completely, you know, this adapter's wired up correctly. Let's just double check. You know, I don't know. You get these from AliExpress sometimes. That is correctly wired. The pins are fine. And this side here is also correctly wired. So I guess the only possibility is this adapter is not universal and that who knows, maybe I just damaged this drive or maybe this drive was already dead. I, I mean, there's a bunch of possibilities. Um, let me grab 
uh, hard drive, first of all, and plug it into this power supply. Make sure that this power supply is working. I mean, I know I've used this before, the light's on. Um, this is all pretty standard. Let me just grab a hard drive. We'll just double check this works. Then I can grab a regular floppy drive, double check this uh, adapter works that I was using. Let's just rule out everything we can. All right, here's a hard drive. Let's just uh, give this a power up here. Okay, that hard drive is spinning up normally. So that means this power supply is fine. Yeah, that's working. Normal clicky sounds that this drive makes. Okay, let's plug in this adapter now and let's get this floppy drive connected. I don't have a computer handy on the bench here, but let's just plug this in anyways. Nothing weird's going on. Do I have another floppy handy? Yes, here's one right here. Oh, okay, this doesn't have a, a spindle on the bottom to see if it's working, but I should be able to hear it work. Yeah, it spun the disc. Yep, I can hear it spinning. Okay, so the adapter works, the floppy drive works, hard drive works, that means the power supply works, so I guess there's either something wrong with this or with this. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm gonna test this other floptical drive here that Carrie sent in, this one here that looks like a normal floppy drive. Now let's get this in. One of the issues with these drives though, and you know, for me, it's a little bit more of a problem, is I like floppy drives that are connected directly to the floppy interface because I can use programs like IMD to read weird formats of these different disks. Obviously with these disks, you can only read a regular PC floppy disk. It's a lot like uh, those USB external floppy drives. You can read either the uh, 720K or the 1.4 meg drives or disks, cannot read anything with weird format. So it's not an ideal situation, but let's plug this in. Oh, okay, sound totally normal. It made some seeky seeky noises. So let's pop this disc in here. What is this? Alphabet blocks, letter names. Okay, I think this is a bad disc. Uh, I don't even actually want to stick it in there because I think it's a bad floppy. Let's plug in this um, plug in. Let's insert this one first. Okay, I think this one's not working either. It's just the um, LED there is blinking. Does that show up? Now this could easily be, this could be the power supply as well. Hmm. Okay, I don't necessarily trust this power supply. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna unplug that. I'm gonna go grab my, my PC test bench. This is going on quite a bit too long. I was, <laughs> I was hoping to get through all these packages sitting here. And that's not gonna happen if I, uh, if I delve into these problems too much. So I'm gonna go grab the test bench because it's a good power supply and I just wanna make sure that at least this thing works and I can get that disc out of there. Here is the test bench. And um, since that 386SX motherboard I had that died because the power supply went bad, I have now switched over to an ATX power supply with an adapter here that goes to AT. So I don't know if this is a better power supply. It's an old one called a US CAN. It's an older power supply that still has minus five and minus 12 volts, which is needed for like some sound cards and stuff. But ultimately I think it's better to use. Either way, it's got all the connections I need to hook things up. So let's hook that up to this LS120. Okay, so let's ditch that adapter. Am I recording? Yes, I am. I just wanted to make sure. I've had problems. Yeah, the sound is working as well, which is good. Okay, so let's hook this right up to this power supply and let's turn this on. Now that sounds correct. Well, maybe. Okay, well, I think the eject button is working. So that works, um, but it was making strange sounds. Let's plug it back in again. Never used one of these. So again, like I just, I'm not familiar with the normal sounds it makes. I won't know until I hook this up to a computer. And I don't think this 486 board actually supports LS120. It's too old. Um, this is a local bus board, but I think it's from like the earlier 90s. 
Uh, so I think I need something with a Pentium. So that'll have to be for a future video. Maybe I will do a video on like weird storage-y things. Uh, that would be kind of fun to compare. Obviously zip disks were the most popular. That's what I had um, back in the day when this came out. Zip disks were a little bit larger than these, a little bit thicker, but were so common, you know, everyone had zip drives, so it was really easy to transfer files. If you had one of these, you couldn't like bring stuff to your friend's house because no one had these. Now what I'm gonna do, and maybe this is silly, I'm gonna hook this drive up here to the power supply, the AT power supply, because maybe it was having an issue. I mean, the wires were getting hot, so that's not a good sign, but maybe it was something to do with the fact that the that little cheap power supply, which I think I'm gonna throw away, um, wasn't giving enough current on one of the rails or something. Let's see what happens. I think this power supply should protect itself if this thing is shorted. Yep. That was shorted. I think I heard a little spark or something and the power supply did not turn on. Oh yeah, that's a burn. So I guess that's it. That's the end of this drive. This adapter smells burned and the drive also smells burned. So something has gone catastrophically wrong. It doesn't feel hot. And I think my disc is is lost. So you know what, since this drive appears like it is, is gone at this point, I don't think this is ever gonna work. Let's open this up. Let's take a look at what an LS120 looks like on the inside. Cause I have never seen it myself. So we'll turn this into a little bit of a, an autopsy video. And I know people are like, oh, don't do that. But I mean, I have that other drive. That's the one that's more useful anyways, since this laptop drive is not something I can use very easily. How is this attached? Oh, there's a screw. That would be how it's attached. Oh, that smells very burned inside. So yeah, I think that drive is no longer going to work, even if I had the right adapter for it. Okay. I mean, I don't know, where's the laser? That's what I wanna know. How do I get my disc out of here? I'm just gonna start taking everything out, every screw I can see, uh, and we'll try to get this thing apart. All right, so I figured out how to get the disc out. This is the eject motor right here, this little uh, black motor here, and I took the screw out. There's a little cam here, and it pulls on that, so that, that pops the disc out. I mean, I didn't need this disc anyway, it was a bad disc. But maybe that allows us to get this thing apart a little bit better because it's still resisting being taken apart. I'm sure I have people watching right now who are like, you're destroying that drive. I mean, it's I didn't ever expect this drive to work again. So if we get to see inside of it, I think that's a bonus anyways. All right, I just got the disc mechanism out. Now it did damage the read write head there, but it is interesting. If we take a look at the read write heads, they look, like normal floppy drive heads. Uh, obviously the stepper assembly is actually a voice coil. And that's because of course the 120 meg discs are gonna have far more tracks than the 80 that a regular three and a half inch disc has. So this has to have much more precise head movement capability. So a voice coil is much more like a hard drive. There are no indentations in this. This thing is completely electronic controlled. But this thing definitely says that it is a class one laser product right here. Where's the laser? I still, that's the bottom head right there. Make sure that's in view. Now also, unlike a regular floppy drive, this thing needs to spin at a lot faster than the normal 300 RPM. So this is some kind of high torque, high speed motor, I'm sure. Don't know what RPM LS120s run at when they're the native media, but yeah, this, this is a pretty trick little thin motor here. Lots of connections on there. I mean, this this whole thing feels like a bit of a marvel of engineering, but if you think about it, by the end of the 90s, manufacturing had gotten far more advanced and all the computer-aided design of, you know, compared to uh, the 80s or, you know, the early 80s especially. So in 20 years, things changed a lot. And there's the PCB, I got that flipped over. So we have lots of ICs here. And um, I think the burning happened over in this area here, which is where that connector is, where that adapter was plugged in. Yeah, giving it the sniff test, it does smell quite burned. Do I see anything that is actually burned? Not exactly. So who knows what happened? It might've been a trace. This thing might be multi-layer. 
So I'm not exactly sure. Anyhow, it's good to know that these adapters clearly are not universal and that whatever was on this drive originally, whatever the, the connection type it had, even though it used the exact same physical connector here, and I think this maybe was for like a CD-ROM drive or something, was not compatible with this LS120 drive. So it is now going to go to e-waste. So thank you very much, Justin, for sending this in. And, uh, you know, I guess in the end, it got us to see what's inside uh, this little thin LS120 disk drive, a marvel of engineering. I should probably keep a few of these screws and stuff, but uh, the rest of it, yes, it's gonna go to e-waste. And also thank you, Carrie, for sending in this LS120 three and a half inch drive with these discs, which does sound like it works. Well, I think if you have ever used one of these back in the past and you heard the sounds that this drive made, does that sound normal to you? Is this drive functional? Uh, I will have to do a future video, like I said, about maybe different storage technologies because I have some other really interesting drives and stuff, things that are a little less common than the ones that we all know. Um, but yeah, that's uh, pretty cool. Thanks, Carrie, for that. Thanks, Justin, for the adapter. All right, next package here. I just grabbed a random one from the box, which is out on the floor there. This comes from Chuck in Brookshire, Texas. Out of all my Texas viewers. Um, sounds like there's maybe ICs in here because I hear loose parts. Oh yeah, electrical components. I like it. Very cool. All right, well, we'll just do a really quick look through there. PMP transistors from good old Radio Shack. A blue LED, now that was fancy. I wonder, if, too bad there's no price tag on here. When blue LEDs came out, they were the hotness. They were the hotness. I remember the first blue LED I got a friend of mine came by and um, we swapped the LED on my stereo on the volume knob on my AV receiver from a red LED to a blue LED. And we I, I think I paid like five bucks or 10 bucks for that one LED. Blue LEDs, yeah, when they came out, that must have been, I'd say around 2000. I don't know if they came out in 2000, but the first one I bought was around 2000. But before then, you weren't seeing blue LEDs and now they're freaking everywhere. And then of course, with a blue LED, you get white and every other color, they're all derived from the blue LEDs. Oh, there's several of them here. So yeah, Radio Shack must've been selling them and they were probably uh, somewhat pricey at the time. PMP transistors, NPN. Okay, that's cool to have both types, awesome. Wide angle red LED, five millimeter, cool. I got another blue LED, very fancy. Those are the same size as those other ones. I don't know if these were like on sale, you know, like, or, um, you know, when Radio Shack was going out of business, got some red LED or yellow LEDs, uh, wide angle red and another red. We got some, uh, looks like these are just nine pins. Nope, these are VGA. So uh, I don't know, DE, is that what this is called? DE15, I always mess that up. I call it DB and, there's always like 50 people who correct me in the in the comment section. So yeah, I got a bunch of those. Uh, these look like relays. I got to put my goggles on to see it closely. Says DS1E-M-DC 5 volts. Yeah, these must be relays. It says 2 amps, 30 volt DC, 0 0.6 amp, 110 volts DC, or 0 0.6 amp, 125 volts AC. Yeah, it's good for those various different voltages and, and current limits. And it looks like you got five pins on there. I think one is just like a, a locating pin. You will have one set of pins that is for energizing the coil of the relay. And then the other set it like passes the current when the relay is closed. Or maybe the extra pin is when it's open, they pass it through there. When it's closed, it goes through the other one. So it looks like we have, uh, we got five of those. And we got a bunch of high current transistors or MOSFETs or something. Let's take a look at what this is. Tip 34. So there it is. I just looked it up. The tip 34 from ST Micro. Can we get a data sheet on what this is? Oh, I guess here it just says it here. So PMP power transistor, 80 watts. Good for up to three megahertz. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Loads and loads of these. So thank you very much, Chuck, for sending in these parts. Uh, I have a kind of a bin of parts that I need to start sorting and it's getting bigger and bigger because the people have been sending in all sorts of parts like this. is It's really useful, but I do need to spend some time sorting. I kind of need like an intern or something. Help me 
get organized, especially all these little parts like this, like figure out a sorting system with the little storage drawer things and put stuff away. All right, next package here. This comes from Larry in Sun City, Arizona. Hi to all my Arizona viewers. Let's take a look at what this is. It's very small. Cut this open with some scissors. Uh, looks like we got some parts and that's it. So what do we have here? What are these? Oh, oh, yes. Okay. Well, these are nice. Fortunately, one didn't survive. <laughs> so you're probably wondering what these are. And I'm sure Larry emailed me about it, but I don't remember. This are, these are like the, um, the drive levers from Tandon disk drives and they break. These are like much better quality parts. So I had a video where I 3D printed them. Now it's funny, you can see this one here did not survive the journey, which is interesting because like they were in a bag in a little padded envelope, but it must've got hit by something in, in, in the mail. But nonetheless, check these out. These are far nicer than the ones I 3D printed and he cut the rods down to size as well. In fact, even though this one's broken, I still will keep that brass rod because it would work with my 3D printed ones. These are really nice. How are these made exactly? Let me put my goggles on so I can look a little closer. I guess these are 3D printed but this seems like, I don't see the lines on these. So, okay, you know what? I'm wondering if these are made with that fancy UV curing resin type of 3D printing, as opposed to FDM, I think it's called. That's the kind of printer I have that like deposits it down on the print bed. Because this does look like it's a little clear, but it's very, um, it's brittle. So um, I'll put a link to the video where I printed these parts out and to be honest, those drives are still working. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't have any reason to believe that what I printed won't last. Also, I used PLA and I could use PETG, which I think it's more durable. So even if I had a problem with the PLA that I printed, I could just print some more with PETG, which I have never printed with, but I actually have some spools of that now. Anyways, these look really nice. They're very smooth. They, they, uh, they turn very easily. They are pretty slick. Um, in that video though, when I made them, not only did this break, what happens is the original little plastic piece, which is this part, the part that clamps onto the rod, well, it's not even a rod, they're these two little nylon sticks. <laughs> it just splits open and then it falls apart and you can't use the drive anymore. But on my drive, not only did that break, but so did the front drive lever, that whole lever on the front of the drive. Anyways, I printed both those parts. It looks, you know, not, 100% stock anymore, but I printed it in black and it works perfectly. The drive works again. And that's in my TRS CD Model 1. And I at least have like one or two other drives that that has broken on. And Tandon drives, that is something that will break pretty much without fail. And I think other drives as well. So honestly, it's freaking awesome that the communities come together and, you know, had the models out there for anyone to print themselves and get their drives up and working. So thanks very much, Larry, for sending these in. Really appreciate it. I'm gonna have a little baggie full of um, disk drive parts. I'm going to stick this stuff uh, with those parts. Yeah, cool. All right, the next package I have here is from Ron in Missouri. And Ron runs the YouTube channel, Ron's Computer Videos, which I noticed there is a picture on there. Let me switch cameras so you can actually see what I'm talking about. There it is, Ron's Computer Videos, Retro Computer YouTube channel. I got to meet Ron at VCF Midwest. Uh, that was right, Midwest last year. He's a really nice guy. And I think he told me what these are. These are like battery holders. Oh yeah. Oh wow, a whole bunch of stuff he sent. Oh, oh, that's really cool. A fun sticker. Oh, I gotta find my laptop. I've been sticking stickers onto my ThinkPad. Let me grab that. All right, well, I wasn't able to find the ThinkPad. I think it's upstairs. I, I actually brought it with me to a retro computer meetup. That's the ThinkPad that someone donated to me. It was an X2 or an X, 61 or something. Anyways, as Linux has Windows XP on it, it's very useful. And someone asked me to bring it because they needed to run some software uh, that was Windows XP only. So anyways, um, I think it's in a box in the other room. I don't have a handy, but anyways, I've been sticking lots of stickers on that thing. So I will stick Ron's, uh, Ron's 8-bit, well, that's not even 8-bit. This is like a, looks like a Macintosh icon, to be honest, a black and white one. So it's a little bit dithering. Anyways, awesome sticker. So yeah, Ron makes these, or, you know, I don't know if he designed these or what. He told me about it. Oh, there's uh, his March and Tosh sticker as well, which um, it is now April. So I didn't, I don't think I did any content from, from March and Tosh. And I actually had 
I have some Mac stuff in the pipeline, like Mac, classic Macintosh era stuff. Uh, in fact, there's like a Mac Plus sitting right here on the floor and stuff, and I, I just didn't get to it, which is very typical. Anyhow, he makes these little adapters here that allow you to uh, use CR2032s and like wire them up inside, you know, your retro computers. Uh, and there's a little toggle switch, I think, which turns it off and on. So there's a little header here. Maybe if I zoomed up, we'd see this a little better. So we have a little header there that actually allows you to, you know, run the wires over to where it's supposed to be. And then you could just like double-sided stick this onto wherever you're going to stick it. Um, this one here is like the same thing, but it looks like it has space for diodes and two batteries. So maybe if you need like a six volt kind of thing going on. Um, yeah, I'm not sure he had some silk screen markings on the bottom. So that's pretty cool. Ah, look at this here, the Universal Plus SE Classic TTL Video Adapter. Now what's useful about these is you use this and it looks like you, uh, you know, you put a 74LS chip there, wire this up, and then what you can do, and I'm just it's sitting right here on my bench, is you use it in conjunction with an RGB to HDMI, which has a normal TTL input. And with this and this, you can hook up your Mac Classic, you know, whatever, or Classic SE Plus whatever, up to your, uh, a modern monitor, a large monitor. You could project your Macintosh Plus onto a giant wall using like a modern 1080p projector because that is the type of signal that this thing outputs, HDMI and everything. So that's pretty cool. I built up a circuit once for this, although actually I think once I just hooked my Mac Classic directly to an RGB to HDMI and it worked, but I think I remember people telling me that if you want to do it on a Mac Plus or Mac SE, it doesn't work without a little bit of extra logic. I don't remember why exactly. <laughs> Ron probably has a video you can check out on his channel, which is uh, Ron's computer videos. I'll link to that description where he talks about this adapter and probably these battery adapters as well. And it looks like he sent me the parts to assemble these. So there's the TTL logic uh, chip and the socket to go on there. The battery holders for this PCB, the switches, the diodes and stuff like that. That's pretty cool. I like the idea of this. I know someone else makes a little adapter uh, smaller than this and it takes some kind of a battery, like a, a coin cell, and then you can stick it right into the holder on like a Macintosh motherboard. But this one just allows you to have it somewhere else in the case, you know, somewhere that's easily accessible, depending on what Mac you're using, of course, or what computer you're using. This will work on any computer. But the switch here allows you to just easily turn off and on the battery without having to take it out. So you, you eliminate the battery drain as well. And since this one here doesn't have a diode support, that means that it needs to be hooked up to a computer that doesn't use a rechargeable battery, like most of the Macintoshes. But a lot of PC motherboards do have like a NICAD rechargeable on it. In fact, my build bench, which is sitting over here to uh, my left, is like that. And I do have a battery hooked up to it, but I think actually I have it connected. Well, some of the motherboards, some PC motherboards, when you hook an external battery up to it, I can actually just show that. I don't know why I'm talking about it like this without just showing it. So this is it right here. And you'll notice if I zoom up, <laughs> there's a battery and it's connected instead of to the normal spot where the original battery was, which is right there. That's where the battery leaked. I have it hooked up to some headers, which I don't think on this motherboard actually try to charge the battery. So I think I have a diode on there anyways, because I was using this on a different motherboard that did try to charge the battery, but this one, it doesn't output any voltage on these pins, but you need to verify that that is the case. And that is just stuck down on there with a little bit of blue tack that is just holding that on it. There is a bit of hot glue residue there, but the hot glue kept coming off. So I just stuck that on <laughs> with some blue tack and that does a trick. Keeps this thing from uh, you know giving me an error at boot and it saves the settings all the time, which makes me happy. There's a 46 DX266 here with a local bus made in the USA. You know, computer stuff wasn't made in the U.S. for much longer after that. But thanks very much, Ron, for saying this stuff. I'll need to build these up, especially next time I need a battery. I'm definitely going to use this. That's a cool little thing. And I really do need to do another video with your TTL adapter and the RGB to HDMI. And maybe when I get to that Mac Plus down there, I'll do that. So thanks, Ron. All right, the next package here, this actually comes from Seth in Tampa, Florida. And I can tell because it says King Cake on it which is what he always puts on it. It was suddenly hard to cut through, so I don't want to accidentally cut into whatever is in here. Oh, that just put a lot of shrapnel all over the bench. Let's see what this is. 
So what is this exactly? Um, so there's a little tiny personal Bible with some Bible verses in it. Okay, interesting. And what's this little thing here? A lot of times when Seth sends stuff to me, he gets it drop shipped and uh, it doesn't actually come directly from him. So I have a feeling that the Bible was put in there from the seller of whatever this, um, whatever this is. So there's a little tube and something very tiny, I guess. Yeah, there's something in here. What is this? Oh, you know, this looks like a die, like off an IC or something. Let me grab my goggles. Yeah, it absolutely is. So from what though? And I don't even know, um, I'll have to get the, the microscope. I'll get the microscope out and we can take a closer look at it. And let's grab this uh, Anden Star HDMI thing here. This works pretty well. I usually power this up off of uh, a USB power bank, which I just have one sitting there. And like so, and then I need to get an HDMI cable, which will plug in and then we'll be able to capture this directly. And actually before we, I go through the effort to hook this up because I don't have an HDMI cable handy. Uh, it doesn't look like there's enough magnifications. I need to find something that's a little stronger than this. And I do have a little USB microscope and we're gonna use that instead. Okay, here we go. Uh, I have it hooked up and it is working. I'm using the camera app. I mean, this is all a bit janky, I apologize. Let's position this so we get a little bit of a bigger image. I'm doing like a desktop capture. It's not perfect, but it's gonna work better than nothing. So there it is. Um, wow, this thing is dirty. <laughs> what the heck? Oh, I have a lens cap. Oh, I have the lens cap on here. <laughs> no wonder I was like, what is it? It's so dirty. We're not gonna see anything with that. Okay, there we go. Okay, I think that's about as good as I can get it. I mean, I'm holding the camera. Does anyone recognize what this is? What processor or IC this is? Because this is pretty cool. I reached out to Seth after filming this and it turns out it's an Intel 83C196 microcontroller. And uh, here's the data sheet from Intel. Apparently the die was defective and never installed in a package. So this wasn't removed from a manufactured chip. Pretty cool indeed. Of course, it's really hard to do something with this, like display it because uh, it is tiny, absolutely tiny. Holding in on my pinky there and you can see how tiny that is. So yeah, very cool. Thank you, Seth, for this. Um, I'm gonna have to email you and just find out what the uh, information is on this because it didn't even say anywhere in this. There was no letter or anything, but um, yeah, very cool. Thank you. Okay, next package, and you might notice a wardrobe change. Yeah, it's because it's actually the next day. I had to interrupt my filming for dinner and other life things. The next mail call item is from William in Marysville, Ohio. Hi to all my Ohio viewers. Looks like we have a note and some packing materials. So let's uh, get this stuff out of the box. Well, the letter here says it's from Todd, so uh, must be a middle name versus William. Here are the items we discussed. Don't blame me for aluminum foil on the VIC-20 Diag cartridge. Uh, no worry, that totally works. That's the original seller's doing. I look forward to seeing you make good use of it. I'm also curious to see if you ever use the second item. I haven't broken that thing out in years. Be well and keep up the great work. Todd, thank you, Todd. Let's see, okay, so um, I'm sure since Todd referenced it, we did talk and uh, let's see, aha. Okay, well, what this is, is a wire wrap tool. Now, uh, what happens is, uh, let me grab some stuff right here. Here is a spool of actual wire wrap wire. It was actually a ways back that Seth, the King Cake Seth that is, sent in a whole bunch of wire wrap stuff. And I actually have, if I reach over here and I keep these handy, I have a couple of other wire wrap tools. In fact, uh, there looks like exactly the same one. And so the way this works is you, um, you spool this through. There's a little tiny hole right here, somewhere on here. Anyways, you spool this wire through it, and then this allows you to either twist or untwist the wire wrap um, posts. And we have another similar one here, I 
think. Is this it? Yeah, I think this is also a wire wrap tool. So yeah, I have a couple of these. Plus, um, it's right here. Oh no, this is another one. Um, there's This has a little wire stripper on. I'm trying to get centered in the camera, which if I recall, how does this work? I think I feed this through like that. And then if I pull down on this and pull this way, yeah, it strips uh, the insulation right off that thin wire. So it's actually pretty handy when I'm working on this stuff doing, because I use wire wrap wire generally for bodges. That's the most common use these days. Wire ropes, uh, wire ropes, wire wrapping is a little, I don't know, I don't want to call it antiquated, but it's something that people don't generally do anymore. Now that we can um, have inexpensive PCBs made from places like PCBWay or JLC PCB, because of this and open source design tools like KiCad or KiCad, however you want to pronounce it, you don't necessarily need to um, do wire wrap for prototyping anymore. In fact, this is a PCB that I made a ways back. I'm not sure if I ever made a video about this. This board, it's an ISA RAM expansion board for IBM PC XTs. Takes one chip here, 512K SRAM, and allows you to add up to 512K to your XT. And what's cool about it is I can actually map memory up into the upper memory banks. So I have some, a legend here that tell you how to do that. I'll put the GitHub link to this if you're interested in it. I have all the files and stuff all on GitHub, so you can have these made if you so desire. These do work pretty good. There's no issues with it. It was, I don't know, one of my first designs after I did the Tandy 1000 RAM expansion. This uses a very similar RAM decoding logic stuff on here as uh, the Tandy 1000 HX and EX card. So anyways, in the old days, before we had cheap and easy ways to make PCBs, people did wire wrap. It was pretty common. Somewhere around here, oh, here it is right here, actually. Let's zoom out. This is a battery-powered wire wrap tool. So you put some, I think, D-cells in here, and it has a trigger, and you feed this wire through this little thing, and you can, and then push the trigger, and it will wrap it for you, as opposed to these tools where you have to do this twisting motion, which I guess you know can get tiring on your wrist if you're doing a big thing. So yeah, anyways, that's cool. Thank you very much for that. I'll, it'll go with my, I have, I have <laughs> clanking over here. I have a box filled with wire wrap stuff. So uh, it all sort of stays together. I just keep a little bit of it out over here for doing those bodge wires. As the letter said, I think this is a VIC-20 diagnostic cartridge. So I'm gonna have to go grab a VIC-20 and we can, uh, test it out. I don't quite remember all the specifics on this. So yes, aluminum foil, by the way, is not a problem. Um, in fact, I think it's a, you know, a decent way to pr protect uh, circuit boards from ESD if you're worried about shocks and stuff. So let's uh, clean up a little bit here on the bench. I think this is the equivalent of the C64 test harness, but for the VIC-20. I think that's what's going on. I think Todd had an extra one. And he offered to send it to me, and it has a diagnostic ROM that actually tests the user port and stuff like that, which is something you can't normally do. Yep, look at that. So it plugs into the user port, that plugs into the keyboard, that plugs into the IEC, and this is probably a loopback for the cassette port. That is what I'm thinking. Oh, no. Okay, these look like loopbacks. Uh, they have a couple of resistors on them. This is for the cassette, and this will be for the joystick port. So diagnostic ROM doesn't use active testing with these wires for testing these two ports. I guess it just relies on the loopback nature of them. Let me go grab a VIC-20 and let's try this out. I have never been able to properly um, test all the ports on a VIC-20. So this is freaking awesome. I'm downstairs here in my little home theater room and I have a bunch of computers mounted to the wall now. It's a excellent, convenient way to store these things. So they're not just stacked up on shelves and they're on display. So I need a VIC-20 and I have two different VIC-20s right here that I can grab. Well, it's actually this one as well, which doesn't work because it's missing the voltage regulation on it, but uh, I think it could be made to work. This is an NTSC VIC-20 and that one is a PAL one. So let's grab, let's grab this one fitting here. So they come off the wall quite easily, 3D printed brackets. All right, the VIC-20 is on the bench. I have power connected to it. Let me just turn on my power supply first. Uh, this is a later VIC-20, so it uses the C64 power connector on it. Let's switch to the capture device. Let's take a look. Where's the right input? So many inputs here. 
Okay, I think that's the right one. Uh, power lights on, but nobody's home. Really, 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 really. Uh, let's try that again. So, we're getting a black screen. <laughs> so this big pointy doesn't work. <laughs> Something's wrong with it. Let me just double check that the cable is correct. It is. Uh, like I said, there's power. <laughs> well, let's try the diagnostic cartridge. I don't know. Maybe that will help, help this thing. <laughs> I don't know. It could be that I, uh, to be honest, I left something out of this machine. Like it's missing its processor or, or something. Um. <laughs> okay. It's not working. I think what I'll do is I'm going to open this up. We're going to need to do that anyways because of the uh, keyboard and loopback adapter we're about to connect up internally. Obviously, you don't need to connect up the loopback adapter. Like the Commodore 64 diag cartridge, if you don't, then you'll just get some, uh, you know, little errors on the, the diagnostic test, I assume. Like I said, I haven't ever tried a diagnostic test on a VIC-20. Well, there it is, and um, it appears to be complete. Like there's no missing chips in here. So the fact that it's got a black screen is absolutely meaning that this thing needs a repair of some kind. Let's just try this again. And nope, we are just getting a black screen. Uh, like I said, the power LED is on, but none of these ICs are feeling very hot. Vic chip is a little warm, but that's not unusual. Hmm. And I'm definitely plugged into the video cable there. All right, I'm going to grab my other one. I marked this one as black screen. It's going to go over there where I have a big pile of Commodore 64s that are broken as well for future repairs. And this will have to be a future repair. This cartridge here, the Todd sent in, is not like a dead test cartridge. So the machine has to be working at least to some extent. Well, I actually don't, I'm not really familiar with how this works, to be honest. Um, Oh, I see there's a jumper. PAL closed and NTSC open. Well, and it is closed, so it's set up for PAL machines right now. The thing is, this machine doesn't seem to work. Um, I'll use this in the future when I do repair this machine. For now, this is a mail call video. Let me grab one that, that works. Okay, so I have the PAL one, and you might wonder what these leads are here, and that's because uh, this doesn't use a Commodore 64 power supply, so I'm using my bench power supply to, to just clip onto the side. Uh, it's also getting a black screen. This leads me to believe that there is a problem with my capture device. And um, gotta say, this is the retro tank again, and I do get frustrated with this thing. I'm gonna have to power cycle this. I'm gonna pull the power cord out the back, and let's see if that makes this thing work properly. I've had issues like this before, where it just do Freaking hell, like, what the heck, honestly? So I had to power cycle that thing and I, the menus were working on it. it. You know, it was working. It seemed like it was working normally, but then it does that sometimes where it just doesn't decode the video properly. And like I said, the menus were working because this has on-screen menus. So we go to here to composite. I, I had tried both. This will make it color again. I had gone into the menu and switched between those two inputs and <sighs> I'm telling you, I'm just going to go grab my other 64 right now and make sure that it probably works fine, to be honest. And the issue the whole time was the retro tank being its stupid self. All right, here we are with the black screen, non-working one. And okay, it freaking works fine. I don't know why the image is dark. I, it might be a an adjustment inside this thing. Yeah, I'm telling you. Oh no, it's just uh, the retro tank doing its auto thing. So yeah, look at that. And the reason why it's squished is because this is in the wrong mode. There we go. So the retro tank oh, happens periodically and I know better, I know better than to just trust that thing every time because this is not the first time that has done this to me where it has given me a black screen and I just assumed there was a problem. So my advice, if you're using a retro tank and this is a 5X Pro or whatever, the most expensive one, do not trust it. If you're getting a black screen on it, hook the computer to something else or use an oscilloscope to look, look at the video signal to see if it's there. Because clearly, this VIC-20 works absolutely perfectly. Okay, so let's plug in the diagnostic cartridge here. Uh, I'm going to take this jumper off because this is an NTSC machine. 
let's plug this in. First, we'll try it without any of those um, little bits. Okay, I think I've seen this simple diagnostic before. And I guess I didn't realize that it used a, it could use a test harness. It does some RAM tests on the static RAM that's inside of this thing. Obviously, the fact that it says zero, zero days, that implies that this diagnostic ROM is used sort of as a, a burn-in test. Okay, yeah, serial bus bad. Okay, I have to open this thing up and let's plug in the uh, thing. So obviously, this is not a problem. <laughs> so let's take the screws out and plug in the keyboard loop back. That's what I keep trying to say. Anyhow, as I was saying, it said zero, zero days. That implies this is for like burning in. So you could just leave it running indefinitely. And uh, if it's looping and working properly, then you'll just see that counter there. Maybe in the manufacturing of the VIC-20s, at least for some of them, they would like grab random ones off the production line and then they would let them burn in for days and days and days or something like that. If you're not super familiar with the VIC-20, this is the cost reduced version, which has this motherboard that uses 2114 SRAM as, as opposed to the more expensive, larger chips of the earlier one. The earlier one had that large voltage regulator thing going on because it didn't use a five volt DC input like this later one does where the power supply is doing that. In North America, it has this big adapter plate here because in North America, the bread bin bottom parts do not have the extra standoffs in them for the C64 short boards or for the small versions of this. So again, this adapter plate is required. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure you could take a 64 short board and stick it on this adapter plate and then use that inside one of these bread bin cases as well. Because again, none of the bread bin cases, both 64 and Vic 20, have those extra standoffs. So the RF shield doubles as the adapter. Anyhow, okay. So for the user port dongle here, it says bottom on it. Does that mean that goes, that goes down? Why doesn't it just say top? <laughs> like, I don't... That's, I'm gonna put it in with the bottom facing down. So we'll put that on there like so. And then for the keyboard one, it doesn't even have like a, it has pin one there. But it doesn't tell you where the blank pin is. Now if I move this here, the keyboard connector has a missing pin right here. And on the actual keyboard that has a key in the connector so you can't accidentally plug it in the wrong way. On my 64 loopback adapter, it has a little thing and it's not focused there. It has a little thing that says, you know, missing pin right there so you know where to put it not on this one now it does have a one on the motherboard there and this has a one there as well so i'm gonna put it that way where the one face is like that and then this is for the loop back for the iec which goes in there i just plug the cartridge back in and then let's plug in the single joystick port there and plug the video back in and let's hope Let's hope that I don't have this plugged in the wrong way and we cause some kind of catastrophic failure. All righty, here we go. Let's let this run through. There is a light. Uh, I know it's you have a small image only, but there's a little light on the cartridge port, so that's kind of cool. Right now I was testing the video memory, which just lives inside main memory. Oh, hey, this went a lot further. Keyboard test, serial bus test, cassette pour, everything is testing good. And then I don't have the speaker so like that, but it would play probably a musical tone. And the VIC chip, which is uh, the video chip on this, also generates sound on the VIC-20. It's a combined chip. And hey, this is working. Now, question is, is will this work? There we go, it went through a full cycle. Will this work with the ROMs removed? Let's give that a try. Let's switch this over so we can see what this is, I think. I can't quite remember uh, which of the ROMs on this. Obviously there's a kernel and then there's a basic ROM. Let's just take things out until it start, stops working. <laughs> that's that's gonna be my, uh, my test for this. So we'll take that one out first, just put it there. Looks like already that broke it. So that chip is needed. 901486-06. I'm just not familiar enough with VIC-20s to remember like what's what. To make sure that works again and we weren't getting a black screen because the yeah it's still working i just want to make sure it wasn't the retro tank causing an issue as it did earlier let's try that one okay that, that works if we pull the cartridge out and we turn this on what do we get okay non-working system could be a character rom that i just removed let's try taking this one out here okay See what happens now. 
Also non-working system. What about with the cartridge back in though? Okay, diagnostic cartridge is back in. And with these two chips out, ah, okay. So I think this one right here is the character ROM, the one that I removed that's closest to the VIC chip. That one definitely needs to be in there for it to work. Ah, look at that, it stopped on the ROM check. So that's with this ROM removed. So even though the thing starts, at least it tells you that it's able to start. Now, it didn't seem to start without this ROM in there. Let's just try one more time. It would be nice if it could start without either of these ROMs in. I have, yeah, I have a feeling you're gonna need the character generator to be working, which is uh, this chip right here. But yeah, it doesn't start with that ROM removed at all. I think this ROM lives in F0 through FF, and uh, you need to have that in place because when you turn the computer on, the processor loads the reset vector from the top of that ROM. And unlike the Commodore 64, which has a way for the cartridge to replace all the ROMs, that's the XROM line, this cartridge has no way to do that. This can probably only live in the normal cartridge ROM space. I think what happens is once the processor starts executing code out of this ROM chip, it then jumps, if it detects a cartridge there, it will jump to that. I think this ROM is like basic or whatever, and it's not necessarily needed for the cartridge to work. And then this one is the character generator, I think. So we'll turn this back on, switch this over. Yeah, we have a working system again. Anyhow, as we can see, it was working and it's able to test the ports and that's really cool. We have, uh, yeah, testing all these extra IO ports which is something that I was never able to do. Now, I don't think it's gonna be a super comprehensive test of like the joystick port, for instance, because with just this little loop back, it's not gonna be able to test like the paddle functionality, which I'm pretty sure the VIC-20 does support paddles, but it is certainly better than nothing. Um, it is better than the diagnostic without these, which doesn't test those at all. And that's honestly freaking awesome. Uh, I think people are going to be looking forward to a VIC-20 repair, but uh, that is not going to be the case because obviously this machine does work and it was the retro tank all along. So thanks very much, Todd, for sending in this VIC-20 universal diagnostic cartridge and the test harness. Freaking awesome. That'll be good for my arsenal when I do get a VIC-20 that needs some repair. All right, the next item, which I accidentally just opened before I hit record, is from Jason in San Francisco, California. So hi to all my California viewers. Jason went in and sent me what looks like a SCART cable here and BBC Micro B, B Plus and Master 128 RGB SCART cable. And the letter from Jason says, while watching Super Mini Mail Call 56 Maxi Edition on the second channel, I immediately thought of something you could use for that fancy new retro Tink 5X Pro. Funny as I was just complaining about the 5X Pro and uh, here's a cable for it. I use one of these with my 5X Pro and find it extremely useful. Hopefully you'll find it too, as this will inspire you to do another episode on the BBC Micro. Yes, there's actually gonna be another BBC Micro episode coming up soon, so this will be useful. Keep the rubber side down and the magic smoke inside. Sincerely yours, Jason. Thanks, Jason. And yes, indeed, this is a cable for the Retro Tank. So the Retro Tank 5X Pro, unlike the other ones, has an RGB input on it via a SCART connector. So this is the DIN cable for the BBC Micro, which is actually very useful because I have a BBC Micro, as Jason alluded to. I have a couple of them, actually. Um, these were Model Bs that I bought while I was in the UK years ago on a business trip and brought them back with me. They work, so I didn't need to do any repairs, but I definitely want to revisit those. But I actually have another BBC-related uh, machine that I, I want to do a video on, not to mention the Acorn. Is it the Electron? I think it's the Acorn Electron. I always get it wrong. Uh, it's a later sort of cost-reduced version of the BBC Micro. It's not really the same, but it's similar-ish. And I think it uses the same connector for RGB. So this will allow me to very easily hook it up to the, um, the RetroTank 5X. But I also have an open scan converter as well sitting there, which also has a SCAR input on the back, I think. I always use the VGA connector on it. But uh, yeah, so that is very cool. I'm not gonna grab one of the BBC micros and hook it up at this point. I'll save that for uh, the future video. But uh, yeah, thanks again, Jason, for sending this in and uh, it will make a reappearance when I do get the BBC out. And the last small package I have, and remember these are, <laughs> this is frustrating. The camera that I'm using here is an Elgato face cam and I turn off the auto um, exposure so this doesn't happen. You know, it doesn't have this constant fluctuation. But when you reboot the computer, which I must have done, I think a Windows update or whatever, it, it reverts back to being on auto. 
It's so frustrating that that setting does not stick. Anyhow, the last small package I have, and keep in mind these are only small packages, there's a bunch of larger packages back there that are unopened, plus all the older stuff I have, which I keep talking about. Anyways, this comes from someone named Bong in Milpitas, California. So hi again to all my California viewers. And I apologize, this looks like it was sent in as priority mail, hence this packaging. And I think I've had this a little while, although no, I think this came in March. This doesn't have a date on it from my PO box like most of them. Um, but yeah, so I've had this a little bit of time, so I apologize about that. So at least this hasn't been sitting around forever. And let's see what this is here. We have another little box inside, so let's open that up. And the reason why I'm using this camera, not the top down, is I don't wanna expose any personal information accidentally so i just stick to the top of this camera until i am sure it is safe to switch to the top down okay here we go we got some stuff in here got a little letter small box all right here's the handwritten letter from bong uh, hello mr black apologies for taking so long to get the pc sprint to you my soldering skills are pretty trash so please excuse the uh messy soldering job look mine are terrible too so uh do not need, you don't need to apologize for that. So it looks like Bong says to use the PC Sprint, you need to use an NEC V20. So the PC Sprint, from my understanding, is like a PC accelerator. I think it's uh, it's right here. I think it's a clone of an old product that existed and it accelerates your original PC 5150 or 5170 up to what, 7.14 megahertz or something like that. And I think you just need, need to use a faster CPU although I don't exactly remember. If you find it's not stable, you can try a slower clock crystal. Uh, there's a GitHub repository here. So this is it here, PC Sprint. We'll take a look at that in one second. There are four pin headers on the bottom of the PC Sprint. The left two pins are the system reset and the right two with the jumper on it are for the turbo modes, right? This is an accelerator, like I said. I'm sure you can figure this out, LOL. I forgot you're Adrian Black, yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't give me all the credit. I do appreciate as much help as possible. It just cuts down on the amount of research time I, I need to do to look stuff up. Anyways, love your content and the information I get from your videos. Keep my old computers alive. Regards, Bong. Thank you very much for that. Let's take a look at this PC Sprint and I will, um, look at this computer paper for, as a packing material. I like that. Let's take a look at this thing. And um, I think this will be probably too much for me to test in a mail call video. So this will have to be something we'll get to at a future time. Oh, look at this. Right, okay. I kind of recall this now. So there was like a magazine project or something to boost the speed on your old machine. And you took out the clock synthesizer chip, which is on the motherboard, and you stuck this into the socket. So there are pin headers there. And then I'll zoom in a little bit on this. Hopefully that's a little more clear, PC Sprint. You take the original clock generator and you stick it in here. And then there's another one, I think, and then there are these jumpers, and um, this just boosts the, the speed of your entire computer, and you need a faster processor. So I think an 8088-2 should work as well, uh, but any CV20 will obviously give you that extra speed boost as well, and those will work at the faster speeds. So this is a replica of that old thing, and PC Sprint, and let's see, anything on the bottom? Nope, nothing at all. Although these uh, square pins, by the way, are not very good for plugging into sockets on the motherboard, it can damage the socket. So I recommend um, using round pins. So I might actually modify this by removing these and putting in the round pins, which I have some. Uh, these are them right here, I think. Let me see if these are the right things. Yes, these are. So they're longer on one side. So you solder the short end into the top, into the PCB, and then the long end plugs into your, into your board. In fact, uh, these aren't the right ones. I think I have more of them around somewhere. There we go. So they're longer on one side. These are the same length on both sides. This is for like interconnecting two devices together. And these are the ones that I would use in place of. Anyhow, let's go jump to the GitHub and take a look at this project so we can kind of see more about it. All right, I just did a little Google for GitHub and PC Sprint. This looks like it right here. Introduction to the PC Sprint. PC Sprint is a DIY accelerator board released in 1985 and given away for free in computer magazines and on BBSs of the time. It was designed to allow you to overclock your Intel 88 system like the 5150, 5160, etc., etc. 
and I'm sure a whole lot more. It's highly recommended to upgrade to an NECB20 as a standard 8088. Yeah, it was only good for 4.77 or around 5 megahertz. The Dash 2, though, could run up to 8 megahertz. There it is plugged into a motherboard in this picture. So like I said, you pop this one chip out, stick the little board in place of it into the socket, and then you plug the chip you took out into the board. Here's how it works. So it takes the 14.3 megahertz crystal. It's on the board, divides that by three, and that gives you the 14.7 or 4.77 megahertz. The way this little board works is it provides an additional faster crystal coupled with an additional 8284A to generate a faster clock signal that will be used exclusively for the CPU. So it doesn't alter the timing for other things on the system, like this 14 megahertz crystal stays correct. It would cause all sorts of other issues just to swap out that crystal. So yeah, the PC Sprint seems to have have a new crystal on here it says it runs at 22 megahertz and that gives you a clock speed of 7.37 megahertz giving you an impressive 64 percent improvement and scrolling down a little further there is a video here to a uh, video that reese did uh, where he tested this thing and he got i guess uh, a 50 percent improvement i mean i didn't read this but it looks like a uh, seven dollar or six pound improvement wow anyhow if you are interested in making one of these all the keycad files are available the gerbers or whatever so you could just have your own pcb made and you can boost the speed of your old XT dramatically. And I have to say, what an awesome little project this would have been back in the day. You could have built one of these by hand, by hand making a PCB or using a little proto board, and then boosting the speed of your machine by 60% with the price of a faster processor. And then this little board, this chip here, the crystal, and these couple passives. Really, really neat project. And I definitely want to check this out and I will do it in my vintage machine because this is definitely, even though this is a modern recreation, it's a period correct mod to give you a huge speed boost. So thank you very much Bong for soldering this up for me and sending this in. I can't wait to give this a try. And of course I will link to the GitHub repo and Reese's video as well. So check that out if you want to see this thing in operation. And I have to say some point in the future, I will have to do a test of this maybe on a video where I do some benchmarks and we'll see how far we can push this because to be honest, I can swap out this crystal or I can drive it directly from my uh, frequency generator and, and we can see how fast we can push an old XT with one of these and a, a CPU that can run at a fast clock speed. There's one last thing that was in that small box with all the little packages and it was actually a snail mail letter from Hal and he sent this in. It's just a couple pieces of paper. Essentially, it's all the jumper configurations. Uh, let me zoom in here so we can see a little better. It is the jumpers and whatever for the Pro Audio Spectrum 16. And there's a date on the bottom here. This was printed in 1998. <laughs> so pretty old printout here. So that's kind of cool. Thanks, Hal, for thinking of me. I know I think I recently opened up a package that had a Pro Audio Spectrum. So I think uh, Hal must have thought, oh, that'd be perfect. I could send that into Adrian. I would hope that this is archived somewhere on the internet. Let me just uh, take a quick look. And yes, there it is. I think I found it here. It looks a little different on the diagram, but according to the paper, it's um, actually, this doesn't really match. It says Pro Audio Spectrum 16 right here, but there must be variants of it that look a little different. Yeah, and sure enough, like the pictures that are on this webpage here, they just don't match what's on the letter here, the, the way the jumpers are laid out. So that's interesting. And here is another set of jumpers, also for the Pro Audio Spectrum. And again, it doesn't really match the paper here, but um, hmm, interesting. Okay, actually, no, I found the jumpers online. So the Rev C are what is on this paper here. Uh, the layout looks a little different um, than the picture that's on here, but Looks like the jumpers are all the same. So like there's IO base address here and that matches what's here. Open, open, closed. Okay, I don't, actually it doesn't quite match because this jumper block right here, J10, it's got six pins, which is exactly what's on the paper I have here. You can see that, yeah, we'll just barely see it. Maybe if I zoom in a little bit, it'll be a little more clear. So six pins as well. But then when we look down here, 220, it says pins one and two should be on and then everything else should be off. But when we scroll down here, we look at 220 and jumper one and two says open, open and five and six says closed. And for 240, it says jumpers one and two are on or closed. So it doesn't quite match this paper, but at least it's generally in the right direction. Board ID selection. 
That's similar. And interrupt, uh, IRQ2 through 7. So IRQ7, it says pins 1 and 2 should be closed. 7, 1 and 2 should be closed. So that matches. Uh, maybe there you can see it better. That That is actually matching. So anyways, um, yeah, kind of interesting. I, I'm surprised. And this other version here, Rev D, does not even have uh, the same jumpers as this. So I think I just need to draw on here that this is uh, Rev C. Put a question mark. I don't remember which Rev of the board I have, of course, because um, I looked through so many boards that day. <laughs> So thank you very much, Hal, for thinking of me and sending in uh, these jumper configurations when you saw me with that Pro Audio Spectrum board. So if you can believe it, that's it. Those are all the small items that I had in that little box. And I don't think I don't think there are any other little packages. All the other things are big and those will be for future mail call items. So I want to thank everyone who sent stuff in for this video. And also, of course, everything that was sent in on previous videos. I really appreciate it. It just is so amazing that my viewers are so generous and I get to open up all these fun and cool packages and I get to uh, kind of have Christmas time all year round. <laughs> so anyhow, if you like this video, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. Patrons get early access to videos plus some behind the scenes stuff for the higher tiers. You can get that access. Um, there's a link in the description below if you want to Check that out and become a patron yourself. And comment, subscribe, all the regular YouTube stuff. Check out the main channel. And uh, yeah, it's going to be that. Stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye.